Nothing I'm going to say about this machine in this video has any sort of relevance, but I'm going to say it anyways. So this is the PYI Neptune, which is currently being offered in their Indiegogo campaign starting at 699 US dollars, which is, simply speaking, amazingly cheap. And towards the end of this video, I kind of want to get into whether that super cheap price really is a good thing. And maybe I can kind of reiterate on how that fits into what crowdfunding is supposed to be in the first place. But before that, let's stick to the printer itself. So the Neptune is a plus sized machine. It's got a 300 millimeter or 12 inch cube build area, a non-genuine bone fed volcano hardened, which comes with a few different sized nozzles. Definitely a good choice for such a large printer. But of course it comes with some quality trade-offs for smaller prints. And I would have liked seeing the actual E3D volcano in here. The linear axes are all riding on Hywin MGN rails. Awesome to see those adapted in more and more applications. And what's also nice to see is that stationary print beds, which only need to move along the Z-axis, seem to finally be getting some more love. So the heated bed is optional. Depending on which part of the Indiegogo campaign you read, it's an extra $89 or $99. And it's a decently powerful low voltage silicone heater on the bottom of an unsupported aluminum plate with a clipped on sheet of glass on top. It also comes with a bed sensor. Now, since the actual print surface is glass, a standard four millimeter sensing distance inductive sensor won't work. Instead, they opted for a mechanical setup that flips down when needed. The printer's electronics are hidden out of sight behind this panel down here. The main board is an MKS base, and it also comes with an LCD panel, click wheel, and a SD card reader in the other corner of the machine. And what's kind of impressive is how small this printer is in relation to its build volume. It's basically a 500 millimeter aluminum profile cube, which is smaller than, for example, E3D's Big Box, which I built and reviewed here, but offers a larger build volume at the same time. So the story behind why I have this printer so early on in its development phase goes something like this. PYI, the newly founded company making the Neptune, contacted me about promoting their Indiegogo project and their printer. And as usual, I went, well, I have no idea who you are or what your product feels like. So let me have a look at that Neptune first, and then we'll talk about sponsorship and promotion and whatever else you want to do. So the team personally delivered this machine to me from their headquarters in Slovenia. We had a nice talk and all, and then I started digging into this machine. And I've got to say, I was ever so slightly disappointed by a few things. First of all, I double and triple checked with them to make sure this sample was going to be representative of the final machine that would be delivered to the Indiegogo backers, because testing pre-release or beta hardware so far has always left me with quite a bit of taste in the end, as either the hardware was finicky to get working at all, or still had too many beta specific flaws and unfinished spots that I'd be forced to overlook in a review situation and simply trust them to improve things before they start shipping. And that is exactly what is going on with the Neptune, which is why I started out with noting that nothing that I'm about to criticize or praise for that matter would have any sort of relevance for the product you should expect to receive when backing this campaign. Point in case, the print quality of this Neptune unit is pretty horrible. It produces some of the worst prints I've ever seen from a non-DIY machine. And I have a feeling it might be the bed assembly that's causing this as that thing just wobbles around all over the place and squeaks and you know just isn't a particularly nice assembly. It even has the heated aluminum plate as the only structural part directly connected to the already splitting printed parts of the Z-axis assembly. And in fact, PIY have already noted that the Z-axis and bed assembly is going to end up completely redesigned for the final machines. Which, by the way, has been the last I've ever heard back from them after I started complaining about everything else that was still wrong with the Neptune. So let's go through that list, shall we? <laughs> Again, keep in mind that these are flaws I found with this particular unit. The finished and shipped one could end up completely differently for better or for worse. First up, screw ups on the screws. And as an engineer, this just makes me cringe. And not even the ancient cells Mendel had that many different screw types. 
the Neptune packs everything from cap head in hex screws, countersink machine screws with flat and Phillips heads, and even wood screws threaded directly into printed parts with party drift heads. Some of the screws were apparently too long and were adapted with washer stacks, some had the wrong head and were also adapted with oversized nuts as spacers and washer stacks, again some which are already splitting, then there are some that are threaded directly into the acrylic panels which I betcha will split sooner or later, and at a few spots the screws seem to be completely missing, like here at the electronics cover others are completely loose. The next shocking ta -ta discovery was that the power socket reaching into the open build area has a completely exposed live pad. I mean, it's one thing when something like this is inside an enclosed compartment, but it's an entirely different story when you can just reach through the printer and grab your daily dose of 230 volts at 16 amps. That shit hurts. Then it's small stuff that could have been so incredibly easily avoided. Corner radii not matching up and exposing the raw cutting edges of the aluminum profiles or using a heated bed that is way too small for the aluminum plate and will leave you with cold edges. The bed sensor does seem a bit wonky as well. Don't get me wrong, it works, but when you see a rubber band being used to pre-tension the entire thing, you do have to ask yourself how well that's going to hold up after being exposed to the heat from the heated bed for any decent amount of time. These rubber bands wear down and get brittle under any adverse conditions, including heat, so it has no business being used like that in such a sensitive precision mechanism. I really don't see why they didn't use something a bit more industrial and simpler for the Z-Sensor. And again, even though this was supposed to be a very close to final machine, there are still some very rough corners that make it feel more like a design study than a delivery ready machine. You know, things like the top acrylic piece being held in place by stuffed in pieces of heat shrink tubing, the machine lacking any sort of soft feet. So I really had to be careful not to scratch my work surface here and the extruder not coming with springs or anything like it, which would usually be okay if these screws weren't so incredibly loose. Okay, so while the Neptune in its current state really isn't something I'd recommend anyone to purchase, it does hold some promise if it is eventually turned into a finished product. If I find to do so, I might fix it up with a direct drive Titan extruder, a real E3D V6, a larger 230 volt heated bed, these things are super cheap from China, and an entirely new Z-axis assembly. And that brings me to that entire Kickstarter or not thing. So when crowdfunding started to become a thing, be it Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Patreon, or Ethereum, it was all intended to fund creators that offered some sort of value to the community, be it just innovative products, programming, or free education. The goal for Kickstarter and Indiegogo specifically wasn't about selling products, it was about kickstarting businesses to get them off the ground when they could not or didn't want to go for venture funding or bank credits. The rewards the community got in return were intended to be something closer to a warm thank you rather than a heavily discounted pre-order for a product. The thing is, if you have a physical product you want to get out there, making that first batch and the process of even getting there is by far the most cost-intensive process per delivered product a company is ever going to go through. So it totally makes sense to set up a crowdfunding campaign to cover not only the pure product cost, but also to account for research and development of the machines, legal stuff, marketing, labor costs, because you know, people need to eat, documentation, certifications, customer support and service, and so on. And yeah, a buffer in case things go wrong, because something will go wrong at some point. And that's the same reason why I think it's ridiculous when people tell me, hey Tom, uh, you know, just start making your own 3D printers and sell them. Well, yeah, it seems super easy from the outside, but to do it properly is an enormous can of worms you're opening up. And for those reasons, Kickstarter campaigns that are set up to only generate pre-sales for a product that's just barely out of its concept stage, especially when said product is sold without a profit, which guaranteed will end up as a loss once all the other costs are factored in. Those kind of campaigns I just can't take seriously because they are set up for failure. 
What will often happen is that the funds are not enough to deliver all the rewards and machines that were originally promised to the supporters. So the company starts setting up pre-orders, additional pre-orders, outside of the crowdfunding campaign to pay for those original rewards and then somehow also has to find a way to pay for those additional orders in the end. That's roughly what Makeable tried to pull off with the infamous Maki Box, but Ma Maki Box? Maki Box? I never know how to pronounce it. But that is a story all on its own. Or the manufacturer just forgets that they need to go through the process of acquiring a CE or FCC label, which is why the original Pebble kind of had some issues shipping their smartwatches to backers inside the European Union. But you know, I guess first totally reasonable crowdfunding campaign just doesn't roll off the tongue as nicely as world's cheapest 3D printer. And well, arguably that line between unreasonable and PR worthy is getting increasingly thinner these days. I'm not saying that all crowdfunding campaigns are bound to fail. Some actually have a business experienced member of their team to make things work out. Others make it through due to sheer luck. And the last group just gives up on having a life for six to eight months until the rewards are fulfilled. My favorite examples have got to be the original machines from Printerbot and Mr. Beams. Both products that were priced right to get attention, but not too cheaply to just be a scam. But most importantly, they were filling an actual market need with an innovative product. So to close that circle to the PYI Neptune, Obviously, whether you think their campaign is well set up is up to you. Do I think it's a promising machine? Sure, but so is every other decent crowdfunding campaign when it launches. Do they have what it takes to pull through and is this machine well priced? Well, you know, it's probably being sold much too cheaply as the targeted retail price is twice as much as the Indiegogo pricing. But if it turns out anything like they're promising and actually manage to deliver your machine, then you've got yourself one hell of a deal. So I hope you're not too disappointed that this wasn't a full review of this machine. But again, that wouldn't have made too much sense anyways. If you liked this video, I'd really appreciate it if you shared this one or one of my other videos on your favorite social network. And if you want to support this channel directly, have a look at my Patreon page up here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.